Welcome to this week's edition of Thursday Thoughts. Uh, this will be a quicker one this week, I think. Um, basically, I've got three things I want to talk about. Tuning equipment. What to look for in board dimensions, especially for downwind foiling. And then surf foiling competition criteria. So let's start with tuning equipment. This is something that I, it, it, like I've been foiling since 2017 and I haven't gone as deep into tuning equipment as some others have. Uh, you know, growing up, I was always sort of a get used to what you have and work with that, change your stance to make things work. And I think that can be done, but there is definitely something in tuning equipment to make it faster or slower. Um, I did a little paddle up video this week, which you might have seen already on YouTube. And I compared to the previous paddle up video I did, I noticed using the smaller 325 tail, paddling up the 1150 was much harder. And um, I wasn't getting it in two or three, or four to six strokes. It was more like seven or eight. I was wondering what the difference was. And, and the only really difference was the, the tailing. I was using a 325 progressive rather than I think it was a 450 progressive previously. Pretty big difference in tail. So you, you would expect a bit of difference. But uh, I also recently did some testing for access on a, diff a bunch of different tail wings and, and the foil section on them. And um, basically they're all identical. Identical outline, identical thickness. Just, <clears throat> just the foil section themselves were different. Some were 50-50, some were fully asymmetrical. And um, basically they felt really different. There were the tiniest changes in each of these tower wings and it made a huge difference. Um, Zane, my mate, West, Zane Westwood, who's, who's a downwind fall with a lot, he's a legend bloke. He's been playing around a bunch of base plate shimming and um, tail shims to kind of, I guess, figure out the, the way to get the most possible lift while paddling but then being as fast as possible while up on foil. So I try to explain it in simple terms. Basically, if you angle your base plate so that your foil is um, basically always lifting, so you, you, you want to basically create reverse rocker. So if it has rocker, the, the foil angles like this, but reverse rocker does this. So when you pump down, it's like already lifting. So you're creating it easier when you're paddling to make it lift earlier. And th but then one, but with the tail shim, you, you make basically make the tail flatter. So to create more drag or lift, you angle the tail nose down, rear up, and then to make it faster, you bring the nose up and the rear down. And basically, depending if yours is a top mount or a bottom mount, you've got to shim it one way or the other. But the best way to think about it is what is the front of the foot, the, 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 the leading edge doing compared to the rear trailing edge? Is it going up or is it, is it making it flatter or is it making it more of an angle? Flatter, obviously faster, more of an angle, obviously more drag, but more lift. So for downwind, um, if you can get up easily enough, you can flatten your rear wing off to make your foil set up faster. But then if you can't get up easily enough, um, you can either get a bigger tail wing or if you don't have a tail, another tail wing, you can just slow it down. So you can make it draggier, which gives you more lift. Um, it's definitely the cheaper option than, than buying a completely new tail wing. I was chatting to Sam Park from WSS Boards and he's, you know, we're talking about this and I'm like, man, this is probably do out of business. He goes, no, but I want people to be progressing. I want people to progress and um, get the most out of their equipment. He's not trying to rip people off, you know. And that's the same for all four brands. They want people to progress, give them all the options. They can make their own decisions. But I guess tuning your equipment is a really important thing. So basically, uh, for tail wings, if you want your tail wing to have a lower stall speed so it's draggier, make your tail more angled if you want your foil to go faster but you're raising that stall speed so it's going to stall earlier if <laughs> like then you put your tail flatter so the drag you're going to limit you increase your bottom end but you decrease your top end flatter faster decrease your bottom end but increase your top end i think about it as a range so this is the middle you add drag you go this way slower and then if you make it flatter, you go this way, make it faster. That's tuning equipment, just a basic one. And look, I go into all this detail with like little diagrams and everything on my Coach Casey Club uh, membership. If you guys want to have a look at that, um, it's kind of good to see the drawings. I actually refer to it a fair bit because it's really easy to get confused on. <laughs> so I put, the put, I put the shim in the front or the back. Blah, blah, blah. Um, then with base plate shims, obviously, if you want more, 
Well, it's kind of depends on who you talk to, but basically you can change that angle. And that basically for me, I like to have my fuse parallel to my the deck of my board where I stand. Um, and sometimes if boards come with rocker, you need to add a shim at the back of the box, the base plate to, to basically make the box do this more. Some people like to actually create um, pump a little bit nose down. So they add a base plate to the front. And so it actually, it, it does give you a bit more pump. Um, one of my first foil boards I had made by Sonova, we were trying to prevent the nose rocker. So we went too far the other way and I could pump better than anyone else on the original go foil of Maliko. Like I was flogging people pumping around in circles, um, but it was just because that angle. So the angle in the board, um, that was a, I guess I didn't shim anything, but it's just the, this is the Tuttle days. So the Tuttle box wasn't perfectly square with the deck of the board. All right, let's move on. Let's go to what to look for in downwind board dimensions. This is a good one. Um, a lot of people are comparing, I think I spoke about this last week quickly, but they're like comparing um, 24 wide boards to 18 wide boards and they're, they're days apart, like night and day, the opposite. So the, the best thing for speed is length and width, being the width being narrower. The narrower you can go, the faster you, you'll be able to paddle. Um, the longer you can go, the more stability it kind of gives. And then increasing volume also gives stability. So um, basically, when you're looking for a downwind board, if you want to get more speed, you're going to go narrower and longer with more volume. And it's going to allow, and, and the, the, the narrower is, is going to add more speed. But if you don't go longer and more volume, then you're going to lose stability. So width isn't the only thing to measure stability. Think about the length of the board because the length of the board can give stability and then the volume within the board. That volume itself gives a fair bit of stability too. So yeah, just um, just a quick one on that. I just, I just want to tell people like, if you want to go get up easier, go longer and narrower and add more volume because when it's longer board, the volume is distributed amongst the entire thing. And basically, if it's a narrow board, the surface area is less where you're standing. So you need more volume to sort of offset that. So have a think about that. Listen to that a couple of times because that's... So the surface area where I'm standing on a 24 wide board, it's much more. The surface area stops you from sinking. On an 18 wide board, for the same volume under your feet, it's just thicker. There's less surface area, so you're more likely to sink. So think about a leaf on the surface of the water versus a stick on the surface of the water. A leaf will float, a stick will sink. <laughs> Just surface area, surface tension kind of thing. Um, that's a good one to think about when you're ordering a new board. Um, what else? I think that's pretty much it. Um, longer and skinnier will always make it easier unless you've gone too skinny or you've got not enough volume. And then it's going to be hard to balance. The disadvantage of length for some spots is that the length uh, isn't as nice once you're up and falling, but also in some really tight bumps, the length can make it harder to paddle up because you have to take angles rather than just going straight. I, I, it's good to take angles regardless, but that's the disadvantage of a longer board. And, and I guess that on downwind board design, I think we've seen long, that we might go longer, but I think the better guys will start going shorter and skinnier. So say they started at eight foot by 19 and a half, they might end up at six foot at 18, for example. The benefit of being shorter is it's nicer once you're up on foil. It's harder to touch down, I guess. Um, but it's not that big a disadvantage. It's, it's that balancing act. I want to be able to paddle up and I want to be able to ride nicely without, um, I guess, a big board. But uh, look, I, I'm sort of used to longer boards, but... I've been riding a 610 of late and that's been great for me. I haven't really noticed it, the length too much. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing is the balance up. And in the coach case, there's been a big discussion on this. Um, JB has been talking about um, how to balance up. And he's using Kane DeWild's method of basically lifting up the front of the... Um, like the front third of the foil. So you're trying to guesstimate the center of lift of your foil. And what should happen is from there, your board. So if you if I'm holding the board up here, the, the board at the, from, if I'm holding the foil up here, mast, 
board on the bottom, the board should be flat. If you lift your board up and it's really nose high, it's not balanced. Or if it's really nose low, it's not really balanced. You want the board to be flat to the to the ground, basically. And the, the, the benefit of that is when you're pumping, it's not front foot or back foot, it's really neutral. Um, so you're not fighting um, the weight of anything else. Um, mainly works for boards longer than six feet. So for prone guys, I guess the theory is shifted all the way to the back of the box, but I, uh, there are a few loopholes in it. So take it with a grain of salt. Again, that's in the Coach Casey Club. There's plenty to discuss. Um, plenty. It's a full wormhole, but let's keep a uh, wormhole. It's full can of worms, <laughs> rabbit holes in a little bit. Okay, and then the, I want to finish off with surf foil competition criteria. So there's been a bit of a message going around um, Greeny from Lift Australia. He's organized a like a teams and like individual surf foil competition in New South Wales and pretty exciting. It's the first sort of surf, like proper surf foil competition, I guess I've been a part of. We've run a couple sort of um, experimental ones here in Sydney and a bunch of different formats. But um, I guess I want to talk about the format. So I guess what's the best way to run it? Do you think it should be all like four people in the surf, just like a surf comp? Um, and the person... Um, <laughs> closest to the peak has right of way um how do you stop someone pumping around and taking everyone's waves i think the person paddling for the wave should have right away over the person pumping back out to the wave but i don't know it's it's, it's going to be a really interesting one um but i want to talk about more the, the the judging criteria so how do we judge a surf foil wave and is it from the takeoff to the shore or is it the entire ride really tricky um but then the turns itself, so on the wave. So say it's just a one long wave and we're just judging the one wave take off to finish, not not judging the pump back out. Let's um, think about how that would look. And basically, are we getting a bigger score for a cutback? Are we getting a bigger score for a top turn in the white water? Um, bigger waves, obviously bigger score. But if you're doing cutbacks on a bigger wave and big white water rebounds and a tiny little dribbler on the inside, what scores are going to be better? Personally, I think the bigger waves with the top turns should we get the bigger scores? Um, smaller waves and dribbly white water. I don't think there should be much onus on white water hits in soft white water. I think a big roundhouse cutback on a big wave is better. But I guess I want to open up the discussion. What do we think should be scored? Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops, basically. And um, I'm excited to get into it. Um, but yeah, judging criteria and how's that going to evolve? How are we going to run it? What's best? Um, but yeah, that, that's my Thursday thoughts for this week. If you guys want to hear more um, or want more Coach Casey style content, head to the Coach Casey Club at caseyoz.com. But um, thanks for tuning in, and I'll do my Thursday thoughts next week too. Cheers, guys.